Hi guys and welcome back to another review. This time it's a bit of a national treasure. Qingdaosaurus is one of the most well-known hadrosaurs from China and one of its most popular dinosaurs. This is PNSO's Xiaoqin, the Qingdaosaurus. It's 22 centimeters or 8.7 inches long. Now PNSO states 1 to 35 scale, meaning an adult of 7.7 .7 meters or 25 and a quarter feet. However, Qingdaosaurus has been estimated to be between 8.3 to 10 meters or 33 feet, which would make the scale 1 to 37 to 1 to 45. Even the smaller estimate should give you 29.5 centimeters or 11.6 inches. Now, this is the only thing I'm unhappy about, so let's get it out of the way. Despite Qingdaosaurus being one of the bigger hadrosaurs, this is now the smallest. Now, I love the museum line and the supplementary material which many people hate because I get to use it with kids. But when the figure itself is so small, it threatens to go from the sublime to the ridiculous. For perspective, here's another roughly 10 meter or 33 foot hadrosauroid. The name Qingdaosaurus means Qingdao lizard, Qingdao being a city in Shandong, China. The spelling comes from the Wayne Gile system before the Han Pinyin system that's currently in use. Now, Qingdao incidentally translates as Green Island, a fact not lost to many Chinese artists, including PNSO here. The specific name Spinorhinus, as you might guess, is No Spine, from Latin Spina and Greek East. And speaking of that, a quick note about the crest. Initially based on the remains found, Qingdaosaurus was thought to possess a head crest like this, earning it the nickname of the Hadrosaur Unicorn. In fact, even PNSO's earlier work featured the same look. And then in 2015, Prieto Marquez and Wagner analyzed a bunch of fossils, including the type, paratype skulls, and a fragmentary crest. I'll talk more about this in the science part of the video, but for now suffice it to say, this is what their end proposal looks like. And as you can see, it's less freaky and a lot more normal looking. Alright, so that said, let's get to the model itself, and we're going to zoom right into the head. And you'll see that the main star of this model, believe it or not, is not the detail, but the colour. Now straight away, the multicolored blend of the crest demands attention, and a blend of different hues is absolutely pleasing. And like the more lacquered appearance of Caroline here, this takes on a matte appearance. The only thing I don't quite like is the starkness of the black here, and yet the release image suggests that this was intentional. In fact, the color reproduction of the in-hand model is actually close, uh, except perhaps a lightening of the green. And I'm delighted that this bit of red is still here, highlighting the bill in the duck bill. Our detail wise, uh, from the crest, the subtle regional differences like here. And here is obvious that the rest of the face is full of the detail for which PNSO is justly famous. It's really nice to see how these individually shaped and sized little scales come together in a tight-fitting mosaic. The way these raised areas help differentiate the underlying bony surfaces. Now, though it seems to be a callback to shrink wrapping, I do like the aesthetics of it. Now on to the rest of the animal. And first, the neck. And I'm pleased to see a thick, beefy neck. As I explained in the Parasaurolophus review, this kind of look really has been expounded very well in Batozo's fascinating 2020 paper. It's getting to be accepted as the norm, as you can see in this piece on the Saurian website by artist Alex Luco. As I said, Qingdao means Green Island, so it's quite common for Chinese artists to use green for the thematic colour. 
And there's a beautiful depiction in the Tiang Le Tao 2017 paper on Qingdao Saurus. And PNSO seems to have taken inspiration from and paid homage to it here. Now, first of all, you can see from the release image that the color palette is stunning. It seems to be a very hard act to follow in an actual model. And yet, this has done that. You can see the yellows and how they blend into these blue-green stripes. And then these greens. And then the segue into a more orangey color. Even each crenellation here has the variety of color you see in the photo. Uh, there's perhaps a shade of subtlety in the release image that's lost, while this seems more starkly vibrant. But I'd say that never since I first laid eyes on the Miragaya have I seen anything that matches the beauty of it. The body itself sports a typical hadrosaur bow plant are gone on the slender limbs of yesteryear. So you have wrists and feet that are more robust, and what you lose in elegance, you gain in plausibility and stability without keeling over. Now that's hardly an issue because you get overwhelmed by the color, which is so pleasing it threatens to overshadow what's usually a highlight for PNSO, the detail. As a once over will show you, They've still got it. Now just look at that scale detail. Exquisite. The pedigree that began with the Parasaurolophus has carried through to the other heterosauroids, as we also saw in Iguanodon. The hands, the mitten, this updated look based off the Dakota specimen. And just look at the bunching and the squashing of this soft tissue. Now the extras. As a museum line model, you have the expected supplementary material like the educational posters. But there's also this base. Now this is exactly the kind of base that I lamented in my PNSO Ceratosaurus review, with no aesthetic value compared to bases like the Spinosaurus and Giganotosaurus. And as a quadruped, it's not even needed for support. But there are these two holes here, which you can then insert these rods, making a less fidgety support for your marine animals. Before we get to the comparisons, just a little aside on the crests. The general anatomy of the dinosaur skull is pretty much the same. Uh, just like humans and mammals share the same bones in general with modifications, dinosaur skulls also have common elements which may be modified to create different morphologies. For example, we saw in the PNSO Styracosaurus review how the ceratopsian frill is composed of both a parietal and a squamosal bone. In the case of hadrosaurs, first look at a saurolophene skull like the Edmontosaurus here, and a T-Rex skull. 
you'll see they're comprised of common elements like the premaxilla, the maxilla, and so on. Now, the crests of the lambiosaurine hadrosaurs are comprised of two bones, the nasal and the premaxilla, which can be further divided into a lateral part, often abbreviated PMX1, and the dorsal, PMX2. But in lambiosaurines, these are drastically modified to create the crests that we know and love, as you can see in Hypacrosaurus here. Originally described by Young in 1958, this is the holotype IVPP V725. It was unusual for this long tubular structure formed by the nasals projecting dorsally and slightly rostrally. There have been debates about whether this was part of a hollow crest or even just post-mortem distortion, but for many years, this gave us reconstructions like this. Young also found a partial premaxilla and a right nasal, IVPP V829, but did not attribute it to Tsingdaosaurus. And for an idea of what you're looking at, this fragment would be equivalent to a fragment between these bones. Notice also this fragment here, which is part of the lateral premaxilla, or PMX1. Now taken together, this suggests that V829 is somewhere here. In their 2013 paper, Prieto, Marquez, and Wagner proposed that these were in fact also a part of the holotype. They present a suite of supporting evidence, which I can't do full justice to here, but merely summarize with some highlights. It was really a pleasure to read this paper. It's very well organized. The bones are three-dimensional objects, so they can be really hard to visualize on paper. But with the right iconography, it makes it easier to understand. So from the front, here's what we see. First, these paired depressions for the nasal passage. And then a kind of ridge, suggesting articulation with the PMX1. And finally, at the tip, this box indicates pieces of missing bone. And also the right process has been deformed towards the left. It should really be out here, as shown by the arrow. They suggest that this missing part was in fact the rhomboid part here, being the front half of this nasal. They also examined other fragments, for example the premaxilla of IVPP K107, the prefrontal, uh, which is this bone here in Hypacrosaurus. Now, this is unusual in having an ascending process and this flange, and features like this help them postulate how the missing pieces might be shaped. And putting everything together, they conclude that Tsingtaosaurus had a lobular posterior dorsal projecting crest like this. And you can see how this is more in keeping with the crest structure of other lambiosaurines. Finally, let's compare Tui with the other hadrosaurs from PNSO. Uh, first, the Parasaurolophus. Then, Caroline the Corythosaurus. You can see how that slender forelimb is now much less so. Audrey the Lambiosaurus, another beauty. And who can forget the beautiful Ivan the Allura Titan? And the other most beautiful model from PNSO, the Miragaya. Now, really, these are very beautiful models of a beautiful group of dinosaurs. They're all of disparate scales, which is a pity, but when arrayed together like this, you can't help but just marvel at the collective beauty of this group. So that's it for the Tsingtaosaurus. Uh, this is a genus long time coming, and as an animal from China, it's a fitting symmetry to have it offered by PNSO. 
and Pianetto has certainly shrouded it in a gorgeous paint application that gives it the glory it deserves. I only wish it were bigger, especially for a museum line model, but other than that, this is a wonderful piece to have. In terms of hadrosauroids, we now have a good offering of lambiosaurines. We just need more saurolophines. I personally love for Pianesso to elevate boring, crestless dinosaurs such as Myosaura and Edmontosaurus annectans. There's a dearth of these poor animals, and if any company can make them cool again, it's Pianesso. Alright, so that's it for this review. I know quite a few of you have been waiting for this, and now that it's here, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'll see you soon for another review.